999 call. Somebody was outside lurking in the dark and he was shot in the back without any warning. I can't even process to think anybody having a grudge against him. Forensics hold the secret to unlocking the case. What they don't realise is the police can find information by other means. When we have the phone itself, we can extract the full range of data and this gives us a wider range of information. We can link the firearm to a crime scene because we can compare the markings. From a forensic perspective, that may help us put the killer in the crime scene. We were just in the kitchen, just to my right, felt this rush, this roll. I just knew that something was happening that was dangerous to our lives. Okay, what's his name? Michael Rayford. Being trapped in the house? Yes, yes, please, please. My name is Josh. I'm his younger brother. My mum was fast asleep upstairs. I remember hearing these two bangs. It was louder than fireworks. My brother just turned round and ran, and my dad turned round and ran. I looked behind me and I seen these two holes in the window. We don't know. Michael, Mike, wake up for me. We made our way into the hallway and slammed the door shut. He just looked at me, Michael, and said, Dad. And then he slumped. And I just felt, you know, the full weight of him. I was shouting at him, telling him to, to hold on for me, telling him I love him, you know, shaking him, saying it's it's not the time for you. Didn't feel real at all. It was like everything was heightened and my vision went so weird and everything and my fight off flight like, kicked in and I chose to fight. Dad, stop standing there. Yes, yes, you're on the way. There was a small hole in his chest. We turned him over and there was another, another hole there. Yes, yeah, no, no, that's the exit. Where's the entrance? Where? I tried to cover him, his, his holes, with my T-shirt, which, which didn't work. That's when my dad started to do the chest compressions. We don't even know if we're safe. We don't know if we're safe right. to be here right now. We didn't know if somebody was going to come through the door or pull the fire more than two bullets. We were screaming, we were talking to Michael, just stay with us, stay with us. And he seen was our terrified faces, and he was scared, he was terrified. He didn't do wrong to nobody, and I don't have a reason as to why this could have happened. Mike, Michael, 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 Josh, Josh, Michael, 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 Police surround the house. It was our response. Blacked out helmets, rifles. He just picked me and Josh up and took us into the living room. And then, you know, through the crack in the door, I could see that there was people trying to keep Michael alive. The car road completely filled with blue lights. It got taped off and they took him away and put him on a stretcher. I remember looking outside and seeing all of his friends standing there all head in hands, just wondering what happens, and they watched him get wheeled out. He said, um, do you want to hear anything if, he's, if, if, if we get any news? Because he's on the way to the hospital. And I said, yes, please. And about 10 minutes later, he said, I'm sorry, he's dead. And that was it. My son was gone. With the scene secured, CSIs are called in. A scene like this would appear initially very chaotic. There's neighbours, there's fear for other members of the public. You can see the blue flashing lights, you can hear the sirens, the police tape go up, the people in the white suits are taking photos of the key areas outside and inside the property. 
Sarah Thurkel is an expert in crime scene management. Forensically, it's really difficult. There's been no contact between the offender and the victim. The offender's been outside the house, the victim's inside the house. So evidence will be really limited. There may be footprints, there may be tire marks, there may be discarded cartridges from the gun. Detectives go door to door in search of leads. The early stages of a police investigation are absolutely essential. They'll be speaking to neighbours because the freshest memories are the most accurate ones. Those people that may have witnessed something important but didn't know that they'd seen something important at the time. And those are the type of people that can be crucial to filling in the missing jigsaw parts for the police. Before examining the family home, CSIs turn to Mikey's family for vital clues. There may be a transfer of evidence from Mikey on to his father and his brother because obviously they're trying to preserve his life. We would be, have to ensure that we'd seize their clothing, swap their hands, which can be very traumatic, but that may help us put the killer in the crime scene. As the sun rises, CSIs search the garden for any traces of the shooter. The area of concentration would always be on the outside scene first because you're dealing with weather conditions, you're dealing with loss of evidence, so, you know, footprints that might disappear. There may be some dropped items by the offender that may get contaminated really quickly. As a crime scene manager, there are obviously important questions to ask. Who are the offenders? How did they get into the garden? and where were they stood when the fatal shots were fired. CSIs search for any discarded components from the weapon. When a gun is fired, the casing of the bullet pops out of the gun. So from a forensic point of view, that's evidence left at the scene. From a shooter's point of view, the last thing on their mind, even if they're forensically aware, is I need to find the bullet casing before I leave the scene. But when the garden was searched, there were no casings found. It was quite frustrating, but you never stop looking. Search officers with specialist equipment are called to the scene. As they get to work, detectives get a lead. One of the neighbours came forward and said that they had their own CCTV footage. of two lads on a red electric bike around the time and thought that was suspicious. That might have been the people that were responsible for this. The team widened the CCTV search in the hope of getting a better look at the men and asked Mikey's family if they know who they are. But ask me, do you know who could have done this? What happened? Why? But was it Michael you were going for in the first place? We just didn't know anything. There were so many unanswered questions. We didn't know any answers. Twenty-year-old Michael Rainsford has been murdered in front of his family. A neighbour has recovered CCTV of two suspicious men in the area at the time. At the family home, officers continue to search for any hidden traces left behind by the killers. On all major crimes that I've ever worked on, if evidence hasn't been found, you'd always get an extra team in to search who are trained searchers. And these licensed search officers have access to a lot of other equipment. So in this instance, the garden was searched a second time using metal detectors and they do a very systematic search which takes hours and hours. Leading the team is forensic firearm scientist, Andre Horn. In a case like this, we look for fired bullets, fired cartridge cases, bullet holes and impact marks. Those are the things that would assist us in piecing together what had happened and perhaps how it had happened. Andre examines the bullet holes to determine where the shooter was standing. In double glazed windows, when a bullet strikes a pane of glass, it then fractures the glass and it carries with it, not just itself, the bullet, but also all those fragments from the first impact. So the hole in the second pane of glass is bigger. By looking at the holes and seeing whether they are offset against one another, that would then tell us if the shot had been fired at an angle, either up or down or left or right. And in this case, one of the shots had been fired at almost right angles to the window, and the inner hole was exactly centered within the outer hole. The other hole, however, had a slightly different setup. The outer hole was further to the right than the inner hole, which tells me that the shot had been fired from right to left. 
The team target the search opposite the first bullet hole. Hidden by the long grass, they finally find what they're looking for. Two cartridge casings. It was approximately four meters from the kitchen window and a second cartridge case, approximately a meter to the right of the first one. This is a massive breakthrough. Obviously, there's potential forensic evidence on them. There might be fingerprint evidence and especially DNA evidence. You would also be able to identify exactly what weapon's been used. The cartridges are fast-tracked for forensic testing. CSIs continue their recovery. Forensically, it's important to think about what might have happened prior to the incident. Have they done a recce of the premises? So have the offenders been to that location an hour before, a day before, a couple of weeks before and looked through the window? Have they been close to the window and touched the window? And also, not only that, you have to think about how did they get into the garden? Did they open the gate? Was the gate locked? Did they jump over the fence? They may well have snagged their clothing or there might well be some DNA on the fence where they've climbed over. So you don't just concentrate your efforts on the two bullet casings. There's a lot of other areas in that garden that can be examined for forensic evidence. Andre attends the post-mortem to look for further clues. The victim's body is an important source of information. After taking the x-rays, we were able to establish that he had two bullets in his body. There were no exit wounds. One of the wounds was the mid-back on the left side, and he also had an entry wound on the left side of his chest. The bullets were recovered. The one bullet had a slanted impact mark on the nose of about 30, 35 degrees. So I could tell that that was the bullet that had been fired through the windows at an angle. Now that was very important for us to work out what happened. Andre collates his report with the findings from the crime scene. It was my opinion then that Michael had been standing in the kitchen between the sink and the stove. The shooter was four meters from the window. When the first shot was fired at almost right angles, it struck him in the back and that caused him to spin around on his way to the door to get out of the kitchen sufficiently for the second shot to strike him in the left side of the chest. And because he had to move from right to left to get out of the kitchen in order for the shooter to track him, the shooter had also needed to change his position from right to left to keep Michael in the sights. The fact that the shooter had moved and shot Mikey a second time in a different location means, quite importantly, that there was a lot of intent there and also that potentially the shooter had shot before. The evidence tells police that Mikey was deliberately targeted by his killers. I can't even process to think anybody having a grudge against him. Everyone knew him as such a, a charming young man, such a lovely boy. He didn't do wrong to nobody. Michael was a very outgoing, pleasant, happy, funny, caring person. And everybody loved him. He was just well loved. He was the best big brother you could ask for, really. He was the glue to our family. Without him, our family is just not the same. I always looked up to him. Still trying to be exactly who he was. It was always, here's Mikey and little Mikey. I was always called little Mikey. We were that duo that were never apart. He got into the skateboard and I brought him out of his shell. You know, he thrived there. You'd always hear that noise of boards banging. And that was the kid's way of appreciating somebody else's talents. And I think that's what I enjoyed more than anything was going to these skate parks and watching the faces of kids I'd never met and just seeing how good he was. Yes! Investigators turn to community intelligence to find a motive. Michael lived in the Liverland area, just north of Liverpool. It's an area that was kind of built on the industrial heritage of the docks which are nearby. Lots of wonderful families, there are, there are nice estates and nice areas, but sadly there are elements of deprivation. The network of estates in which Michael lived in were very much the heartland of the gang. There was no one 
quite widely as the Kirkstone Riot Squad, and at this time they were having trouble with a gang called the Lineker Young Guns. They both had a degree of organisation around the violence to protect their own business interests, essentially, which is the drugs trade. As they look to expand their networks in, in, in the hope of expanding their profits, they step onto other people's patches where they sell drugs. It's quite easy then to understand why you then may have conflict in two particular post codes because everybody's fighting for space, territory, and ensuring that their respect and their name is known in a particular area. The Rainsford family home is in the middle of the estate dominated by the Kirkstone riot squad. Police need to determine if this is relevant to the murder investigation. Mikey's family recall a previous incident involving local gangs. About a year earlier, on a summer night, him and his friends were uh, sitting outside the communal flats. Without warning, a motorbike came round the corner and rode straight at them. Because he had a bike, he couldn't run into the flat with his mates. He had to ride away and even started chasing them. Uh, there was two people on the bike and one of them had a machete. I remember him coming home, pale in the face, out of breath, looked like he'd been so shook up. He said, lock the doors. And I turned round because I heard this, the roar of an engine, so loud. And I look out the window and I see these two lads on the back of a bike. He came into the front garden and actually took the mountain bike and put it on his shoulder and rode off. I didn't have a clue what was happening or why. That's what these people do for fun. I think that they get an enjoyment out of it. We logged it, reported it, told the police. And uh, Michael said to me, he said, um, I don't like living now, do you, Dad? If we'd have took it seriously enough, or we'd have just decided to move, but there was never ever another incident, and we never really talked about it again. But I don't think they were linked. Police need to determine if Mikey has links to any local gangs. The reality is that when you have incidents like this of this very nature, you can quickly piece together an idea as to why the person may have been targeted. The people who are involved are normally involved in a similar background. The context is crime. The police will be looking for strong evidential link between Mike and with gangs from the surrounding areas. CSI search Mikey's belongings for clues. The police had to investigate every avenue. And obviously one of them involved checking on his lifestyle, checking his bedroom, checking his bank accounts. Michael had one pound ten in his pocket. Didn't find a single thing. No money, no weapons, no drugs, no paraphernalia, no nothing. There was absolutely nothing that showed him to be that type of person, because he wasn't. It became quite clear that this wasn't your typical victim of gun crime. You know, this was a young lad that had pursued his education, a popular, bright, talented young lad who had no real backdrop to, to criminal activity. He wasn't somebody that you could find an obvious reason as to why something as, as serious and as poisonous as this had happened. Back in the lab, forensics are examining the cartridge casings. Once I had the opportunity to examine the cartridge cases at the laboratory, I was able to determine that they had both been discharged in the same firearm, a 9mm short calibre self-loading pistol. Most likely a Makarov-style pistol uh, of Russian origin. And we could tell that from the firing marks that had been left on the cartridge cases and the bullets. Finding the gun is the investigation's best chance of identifying Mikey's killers. We can associate a firearm with a person from the DNA recovered from a firearm. And then, of course, we can link the firearm to a crime scene because we can compare the markings. So the striation marks or scratch marks on the casing is unique to that gun. So it's almost like a fingerprint for the gun. So if you can find the gun that it was fired from and do test shots, you're able to match the bullets back. We had cartridge cases from the scene, we had bullets from the autopsy, and both were then used for comparing to a database of firearms and shooting incidents in the country. And some links had been made. This gun had been linked to two other shooting incidents 
in the Merseyside region uh, prior to Michael's shooting. Once that gun's been utilized in a particular crime, rather than get rid of it, they sell it on to another group of individuals because essentially it's like a car. You use the car, you burn out the mileage, you sell it for whatever price that you can get it for, and you move on. Licensed search officers look in all nearby bins, drains, and parkland for the gun. And detectives speak to members of the community. People are worried about snitching simply because there's repercussions that come with that. There's an unseen code or unknown law within communities that when you cooperate with the authorities, there's things that can happen. Then what oftentimes happens is that wall of silence. And as the police will say, that wall of silence is one of the hardest things because people in the community want justice, they want peace, they want their communities and streets to be safe. But how can they be safe if you're not willing to break the silence? But the murder of Michael crossed a threshold that just led to an overwhelming reaction of people saying, you know what, regardless of the idea of snitches get stitches, I'm willing to kind of put myself at risk to try and help this family, this, this upstanding family within their own community to get justice. We were told by FLO officer at the time that they received over a hundred phone calls the same day, um, giving information in. Everybody spoke out, everybody helped. They are given the same two pseudonyms again and again. Pip and Worm. Detectives use police intelligence to find their true identities. If they can identify who that is quickly, then they can take massive strides in an investigation. That potentially leads them to the perpetrators. After appealing for information about the shooting of 20-year-old Mikey Rainsford, police have been told his killers go by the nicknames Pip and Worm. I didn't have a clue who they were because of the area. You hear things, you hear names. I didn't have a clue who they were. Detectives run the pseudonyms against police intelligence and get a result. They are identified as brothers James and Michael Foy. They did carry a reputation. Michael Foy, who's the older of the two brothers, you know, I previously sat in court with him whilst he got jailed for a previous drug offence. And within that case, he was named as being linked to the gang called the Lineker Young Guns. Michael Foy's younger brother, James, is also found to have links to criminality. There's a hit against him on the National DNA database. Related to the finding of a, of a gun that was discovered, not far from where the Foy's lived in November 2019, so some five months before the murder. The firearm was a, a, a Grand Power K100. It's a Slovakian pistol, and it is not the same caliber of firearm that was used to shoot Michael Rainsford. Um, it's a more powerful caliber. So there's normally a joint fingerprint and DNA examination, and it's done of a weapon. And normally the areas that have been handled and touched, like the grip, the trigger mechanism, are swabbed for DNA because they're too rough to get fingerprints on, and also potentially they're too small. So in this case, there were four different profiles found on this gun. The strongest profile was found on the magazine of the gun, and this came back to James Foy. It was recovered with more than 20 rounds of ammunition, and that only one of the cartridges was in fact compatible with the gun. That could perhaps mean that he had access to more than one firearm. He wasn't convicted, but it could show that for months before the murder of Michael, James Foy was already caught up in this type of activity. He was already having access to firearms. He was already involved in the type of gangland activity that had the potential to lead to something as serious as the murder of Michael Rainsford. When we're talking about urban youth crime, and especially things like gangs, individuals that are involved in drug trade, guns tends to be a thing that comes hand in hand. Having a gun shows more superiority as it relates to holding a knife. Loads of young people carry knives, but when you hold the gun, having a gun brings a different type of power. Despite the Foy brothers' criminal history, the team need evidence linking them to Mikey's murder. Turning to police intelligence to find out more about the pair, the team discover an incident that took place an hour before the shooting. 
There's a PC who was driving past the area in which the Foy's lived. She looked down the street and she saw two males on an electric bike, which are quite often used by criminals in order to transport drugs and, and guns. She's suspicious. She goes and have a look down that street. She witnesses quite a commotion. And that was because the house had its windows put through with bricks. The officer took a witness statement. I'm just taking a statement now. All my blast came flying through the blind. And I feared they found the first brick in um, the behind two seater yeah. the, um, inside the living room. How long after was it? Did you text the boys and tell them? Yeah. Yeah. And they have a red, was it a red electric scooter you said? Electric bike. What are your son's names? My son. Yeah. I know where they are, mate, but I have to obviously actually don't want to put words into your mouth. A brick has been thrown at the home of James and Michael Foy. When we talk about gangs and urban groups, status is everything. A brick thrown through a window through the lens of an individual that's a part of a gang or a group, that's a high level of disrespect. They want to protect their reputations. If they feel slighted in any way, their response will quite quickly lead to violence. That's how their reputation thrives and exists, mainly through fear and intimidation. And if you come at me, I'll come back at you twice as hard. The incident gives police a potential motive for Mikey's murder. If the voice suspected he was involved, the shooting could be an act of revenge. That could potentially be circumstantial evidence, but what you really need is a crucial piece of evidence that connected the Foy's to Michael Rainsford. The team request his cell site data to track his movements. It's really important to obviously to treat the victim as a victim, but also you need to look into any communication with these potential offenders or any other gang members. And also there may be other phone data on Mikey's phone that may be pertinent to the investigation. With very little forensic evidence, the SIO's main thrust of the investigation would then be towards the digital side, troll of CCTV, social media, to see if there's any intelligence that comes up. Social media has had a massive impact on, on police investigations over the past decade, the proliferation of sites on Facebook, Snapchat, uh, Instagram, all those others as well. And it's often one of the most interesting places for the police to go to in the aftermath of an incident series of this. And actually that kind of gives police an additional option when they're looking for information. The Foy brothers were very well known on the local estate for riding around terrorising the local residents on electric motorbikes. There was a lot of photographs on social media about the bikes, but interestingly, one of the bikes was red in colour. Just like a witness stated that there was a red bike at the scene, so finding that red bike becomes a really important part of the investigation because there's a wealth of forensic evidence that might be on that bike. Having completed the forensic harvest of the crime scene, the Rainsford home is returned to the family. We'd made a decision to give it a try to come home, but there was glass everywhere in the kitchen. The half-eaten birthday cake was still there. The trauma to walk past that window, to wash dishes, and know that everything we ever did in the house, Michael was a part of it. That was my home since I ever known. Millions of memories made there with my brother, with my family. It just, it took away a part of me that I'm never gonna get back. Two days on from Mikey's murder, police are granted a search warrant for the Foy's family home. The purpose of the house search is to search for any evidence that may link that offender back to the crime scene. So there's always like a list of priority items that might be found. You would obviously be searching for a weapon, an electric bike, a mobile phone, or potential clothing. None of the items of interest were found. Then that obviously arouses suspicion. Where is this bike? A hypothesis is, well, maybe they're not involved in the incident, but also another hypothesis is, well, they are involved in the incident, but they've got rid of those items in question, that maybe there's further scenes that need finding and examining. The warrant also allows police to seize the Foy family's mobile phones. Now, one of the slightly bizarre and surreal coincidences is they would have you believe it. Michael Rainsford was shot dead just after 11 o'clock on the night of April the 7th. Over the course of April the 8th, both brothers and their mum managed to somehow lose their phones. 
it's very clear to see why suspicions were raised within the police. If they are involved, that shows a certain level of forensic intelligence by the offenders that they know to get rid of items. But what they don't realise is just because they don't have the phone itself, the police can find information by other means. Mobile phones now store so much about our lives that they really are almost like a personal diary. In a case like this where we don't have access to the phone itself, you can go to the service providers and get the call logs, which will give us a breakdown of when calls were made, the cell site towers that were used, the locations and other data. It's important to identify where people were just before the murder took place. There's no better way of doing this than cell site analysis. In order for a phone to communicate, it sends and receives a signal to the nearest of the 1.5 million cell site towers across the country. These cell site towers are continually sending and receiving data. When we're looking at where perpetrators may have been, cell site location can give us a rough proximity that can tell us they were within a few streets. The data shows that the Foy's mum called James minutes after the brick was thrown into their window. James then immediately calls his brother. When looking at cell site data, we can compare different people's traffic and see where they overlap. When they overlap, it's likely that they were together or in a close proximity. Those movements of those devices suggest that the pair who were at opposite ends of Sefton decided to meet up with each other, go home, and then move to the murder scene. They were able to look at CCTV along those suspected routes of those mobile phones to see if the two mirrored each other. They could find corresponding CCTV images for the same time in the same areas showing two males on the back of an electric bike. It's a massive breakthrough. It's really important for the crime scene manager to view that CCTV evidence to see where they were at the scene, what routes they took, what the offenders were wearing. There's potential forensic evidence that might be found on those items of clothing. There's not going to be any contact trace evidence because the offenders haven't been in close contact with the victim, but they've fired a gun. There may well be gunshot residue. Following up on intelligence, licensed search officers raid other homes on the Foy Street. While they look for any hidden evidence, the results from Mikey's cell site data are in. His phone was tracked along with everybody else as well. And his phone was in our house, and it went from our house to an ambulance. And then, when the police received his phone, it was in, it was in the motor tree. The police explored all the avenues that were open to them. His mobile phone, his cell site data, to speak into witnesses. It's very, very clear that Michael had absolutely no involvement in that brick attack in the first place. In a neighbouring house, search officers find a bag of clothes hidden by the foys. It's fast-tracked to the lab for gunshot residue analysis. Gunshot residue is chemical trace elements that result when a cartridge is discharged. It is quite unique and it is deposited on surfaces that are in close proximity to a firearm when it is discharged. Samples obtained from the examination of the garments will be analyzed with an electron microscope. Now what's quite interesting is the fact that they did find some gunshot residue on the coat, but they found some very, very few particles. Because of how few there were, they couldn't specifically say that that coat had been worn during a shooting. It's not possible for a forensic scientist to say that's conclusive evidence. So it's a bittersweet moment. It's not enough to be able to charge somebody. I would imagine the police would have found that quite frustrating and desperate to find further evidence to be able to nail the offenders. They had lots of things they could go, when you add all these things up, how could it not be them? But what you really need that final piece of information around them which they could build the rest of their storyline. The team doubled down their efforts to recover the Foy's phone data by targeting their associates' devices. In this case, the Foy's and their mum had got rid of their phones, but it's also really important to them find the phones that they've been communicating with, maybe further intelligence and evidence on the other phones. On one device, experts recover a social media post of interest. So the way in which Snapchat works, if you put a message on there, it will quite often it'll disappear after 24 hours. But if people interact with it, it can leave almost a forensic trail on people's phones. When an expert goes in to analyse it, they can find traces of that interaction. And what they found was that 
on April the 7th that this individual had responded to a Snapchat message from the account that was known to be operated by James Foy in which he had put an image of the bike that was known to be involved in the shooting, a bike that was known to be owned by the Foy brothers and within it was the caption, tell your ma duck, don't use bricks, two bang emojis. Bricks had gone through the window of their own mum's address, well in response they were going to do something else. They were warning essentially that their next victim's mum to duck something was coming through their window it wasn't going to be bricks sometimes social media creates narcissistic tendencies so when you post on platforms like snapchat instagram youtube tiktok oftentimes it's about look at me look at me look at me which goes back to the conversations about status respect being known being seen being heard in a little community within liverpool you can make the world know who you are through Snapchat. The message supports the police's hypothesis that this was a revenge attack. Though why Mikey was targeted remains unknown. The Foy brothers are arrested on suspicion of murder. Honestly, no one they was arrested. I can't even say I was relieved. I definitely felt safer. But Every other feeling that I felt still felt the same because my brother was no longer there. My role model, my big brother, just because they've been arrested, that doesn't mean he's going to come back. In custody, police question the brothers. Michael Foy says he was with his partner on the night of Mikey's murder. Police ask James Foy about the previous gun allegation. He says he's never seen the gun and claims his DNA must have been transferred from another object. The Foy's played their cards very close to the chest and essentially answered no comment to the vast majority of the questions. If you were arrested on suspicion of murder and, and you hadn't done it, then surely you'd be there saying, oh, no, I was here, I was there, I was doing this, I was doing that. If you say no comment, well, maybe that's because you've got something to hide. Despite their refusal to speak, the wealth of evidence means both are charged with murder. Mikey's family prepare to face them for the first time in court. I wanted to look both of them in the eyes the whole time. Just, I just wanted them to know who we were as a family and what, what they'd done to us. Six months after being charged with the murder of 20-year-old skateboarder Mikey Rainsford, the trial against James Foy and older brother Michael Foy begins. The communities of Seaforth and surrounding areas were all breathing a sigh of relief. That got funny. These animals have finally been taken off the street. The evidence is presented to the jury. When cases go to trial, they can be incredibly intense and quite stressful. You're never quite sure how the jury is going to react, especially to a huge amount of evidence. It's the mobile phone style site analysis and it's the CCTV images. It suggests that the brothers met up with each other on a red electric bike and then went over to the area in which Michael Rainsford lived around the same time that the gun was fired. The prosecuting barrister details, the rider waited outside the address while the other climbed over the gate to the back garden and lay in wait for his target with a loaded gun. Tragically, the two gunshots are heard on nearby CCTV. Although only one of the Foy's pulled the trigger, the prosecution argues both are to blame as the brothers were out intent on retribution. It was an organized gang member who decided that he wasn't going to accept his window being broken and he was going to dish out retribution to somebody, anybody, to show what kind of person he was. One of the many tragic elements of this case is the fact that whilst police had the motive for the murder, it's clear that Michael died as a result of that incident but had absolutely nothing to do with it. Police suspect someone known to both the Foy's and Mikey pointed the finger at him. But why remains unknown. 
And I was told that all your questions are going to be answered throughout this trial. Sadly, they weren't. It haunts me every day. It's clear that after their boys, home was bricked. Their gut instinct, their reaction was, well, it's probably by someone from our rival gang. So going to the rival gang's turf was probably a natural reaction. And when you looked at the CCTV, you could see them peering over a back garden gate looking into another property. Suggests that they weren't necessarily set on and addressed the target when they set out there, which has some more questions about how they ended up at Michael's address in the first place. Street gangs do feel that notion of nobody can touch me, and that may help to explain why you have sporadic violence. They don't care about forensics and stuff like that because maybe at some point they actually think that they're untouchable. Michael was in the kitchen and he had absolutely no idea that somebody was outside lurking in the dark and he was shot in the back. For me that is perhaps cowardly and I could just imagine how traumatic that must have been for Michael's family. The jury retire. 16 hours and 20 minutes later, both brothers are found guilty of Mikey's murder. It was all over a broken window, which he didn't do. When the trial actually finished, he said, we'll be out in a few years, but your Mikey will still be in the ground. And that stuck with me. At the sentencing, Mikey's family are in for one more heartbreaking detail. James Foyt actually admitted to be the one that pulled the trigger of the gun. I'm assuming in an attempt to lessen his sentence and put the blame more on himself rather than his brother. That doesn't necessarily help the family. It does give them a degree of closure over that chapter in their life, but it won't bring anyone back and that's heartbreaking. We'll never come to terms with the sentences of it that being murdered for something that he had nothing to do with and then destroy your family. Michael Foy is sentenced to life with a minimum of 30 years. James Foy is also convicted of possession of a gun and sentenced to life with a minimum of 28 years. Afterwards, I was called a grass. I received death threats. I got added into a group chat and there was quite a lot of people in there just hailing insults, horrible, horrible, horrible things. Pictures of dogs uh, shitting on Michael's grave will put two bullets in your chest, just like we did to your Mikey. They murdered Michael. No, they terrorised us. We couldn't stay. We had to move out. We loved that house. We had a million memories of all the things we did as a family. You know, your Christmases, your birthdays, trampolines, swimming pools. Countless memories just taken away by evil that just decided to choose our house, choose Michael. I miss the arguments that you have with your brother over the petty little things. They're the things you really take for granted. You wish you could have it all over again. I miss the laughs, his banter, everything about him. From the good to the bad, I just miss it all. That's my big brother. Yes! And I'll always love him.